Thank you're you. coming to the end now of three months in the United States. The most significant single experience, I suppose, of all forum delegates have been their experiences in a number of different American high schools. I wonder where your thinking is now at this point. Do you still think the same things about American education as when you came, or uh, have your ideas changed any? How about you, Johnny? Well, about two weeks after I came to America, I got on television and started criticizing the educational system. I described it as easy, lazy, and noisy. <laughs> I said it bred immaturity and it bred mediocrity. I didn't even try to conceal my contempt for it because I didn't think very highly of it at the time. Well, that was a real bombshell because <laughs> I spent the next <laughs> 10 weeks trying to explain myself. I was the subject of several letters of protest to scholastic magazines. I was the near victim of a high school lynching party. And, you know, things are so bad that I couldn't even find an insurance firm in New York that would guarantee my safety. <laughs> well, what's so ironical about all this is that my views have already changed. And we always do tend to <coughs> criticize first and then understand the good points afterwards. But, you know, I still find that my basic point... Well, now, I, what is that basic point, Johnny? Well, it still stands that in, in order to make your... Um, in order to lead the free world more effectively, the United States must make the educational system a greater challenge to the more intelligent students. Would well, you differ in that uh, substantially from what uh, a lot of our educators are saying? No, that's exactly... Actually, uh, when I got off the first television program, I found I'd said a lot of nasty things. Then I read Fulbright's articles on it. I read uh, the Conant book, the Rockefeller Report, and they all agreed with me. <laughs> <laughs> well, the basic point, then, uh, is that we've got... State it again so we're sure we understand you. Well, I think that uh, the American system caters very well for the average and below average pupil, but it's the leaders that are important for America at the moment in your struggle with Russia and the, with the communist bloc in general. And I think you've got to give these people a better chance, a greater opportunity. Well, now, you've said an awful lot about your schools in comparison with American schools. I'd like to know how some of your schools compare, wouldn't you? Have you spent any time finding yeah. out from each other how your schools compare? Uh, yes, there are some <laughs> very considerable differences. Uh, I think... Uh, my school, it, my, uh, our standard is higher than the United States. Uh, after the war, we adopted the, uh, the education of just like the um, United States. But uh, still, uh, our <laughs> I think still our education is higher than the United States. And uh, so uh, we have to take at least 12 subjects in a year. It's all required. That's very interesting, because you have the American system, which is supposed to be very liberal. I have the British system, which is supposed to be very austere. And I have three compulsory subjects in the week. Oh, three? Three. History, Aye. French, and economics. And that is all I'm forced to take. Oh, the rest is purely voluntary. And even Aye. those three subjects are elected. Oh, it's much more in Denmark. In Denmark, we can't... Well, we have a little choice. We have a choice between taking a major in languages and one in science. I took the one in science. But uh, otherwise, we can't choose between. We have, uh, let's see... Oh, I don't remember the number in eight or nine uh, compulsory subjects. All of them are compulsory. How about but language? Well, as I said, we had two different majors. We can take a language major, and then we will take English, German, French, Latin, Danish, and then read a little uh, Norwegian and Swedish, too. But uh, now, as I said, uh, I took the scientific one, so I have only French, and English, a little English, and Danish, and then a little uh, the Swedish and Norwegian again, but I took German and uh, Latin in the first years. No, that's compulsory in the first years. Nobody can go and to high school without knowing them. When do you start? Oh, I started learning English when I was 11. Most of them started at 12, and then German the next year. And uh, how about you, Jan, from Iceland? How many languages do you take? Well, in senior high school, everybody's obliged to take eight languages. Eight? Eight languages, yes. What are they? Well, uh, in senior high school, it's, it's Icelandic. Old Norse, that's ancient Icelandic, and really it isn't too different from Icelandic. And then it's Danish, <laughs> Swedish, English, French, German, and Latin. I think and they, they used to take Greek, too. <laughs> they don't take Greek anymore? They don't take it anymore, no. I mean, take but, it. Uh, I want to. But, uh, for that English uh, language, we, we cannot study other languages except English, because English is uh, completely different from our language, Japanese. And so we have to study uh, many, many Chinese characters. And also we have uh, very 
hard uh, grammar. So we cannot study it. It's English, it's enough for us. <laughs> I think this is one of the things that we all agree yeah, on, yeah. though, that although the American system has a lot of excellent points to it, this is one of its very bad points, the language problem. Do you all agree on that? Yeah, I think they start far too late. You know, when they start learning, well, how are they, all of they, 14, 15, sometimes when they start, then they take uh, French or Spanish for one or two, and some of them for three years. And if you take it for four years, well, that's very, very advanced, you know. And, but of and course there's some. Isn't there any justification? Oh, of course, there's oh, one what? justification. They do come all over the, all over the world near the English. But you must remember that. If you come abroad, friends, well, we don't expect you to learn Danish, but French. If you come abroad and um, and you only know your own language, I don't think that you'll ever be accepted in the, in the way that you would. If you're shown that you want to do something about it, that you really wanted to be accepted, if you show, you show that you are taking the travel no, to take wait German a minute, and Ivan, French... Let's be realistic. Americans yeah. travel all over the world. They can go anywhere That's right. with English. That's right. Oh, oh yes, <laughs> but this, this is the attitude that underlies the ugly American. Yeah. You can't understand the French unless you know their language. And the Americans... Good. Americans... Uh, students should learn uh, other language because um, English is the basic language of other European countries. Language, I think. Uh, and anybody but Johnny agree with that? And you can learn a um, sentence system uh, or other grammars very similar. I wonder why you don't say we should learn Japanese. <laughs> no, <laughs> I think it's. <laughs> it's hard for <laughs> <laughs> You mean to say we wouldn't be as capable of learning Japanese as you are capable of learning English? <laughs> they can't even learn uh, French. <laughs> but I think compared to English, uh, Japanese is hard. How long does it take a Japanese child in the first grade before he can write? Always before we can write. Mm -hmm. uh, we start to learn English. No, when, I'm talking uh, about Japanese. Learning Japanese, Japanese oh, for sorry. a Japanese child. Japanese. Uh, we start to learn Japanese. Uh, uh, when I, oh, elementary school, first year. Mm -hmm. uh, well, if you don't think we should learn Japanese, uh, what uh, do you think we should learn about Japan? What is, what's been uh, your experience here? What do American students know about Japan? Oh, I di <laughs> really, <laughs> I didn't expect to find uh, American students learning Japanese, but really I was disappointed because they don't know about Japan at all. Uh, a bit the influence of the American occupation, or mm, always I was asked, and uh, also the present context with the U.S., and uh, how Japan has changed be since the war. Uh, Japan has been changed completely by the United States. Completely? Yes, completely. <laughs> uh, for instance, uh, we, before the war, we had, uh, we had to worship uh, our emperor. And every morning, they worship emperor at school. And now we don't have to. It's, it's democratic, it's good. <laughs> but uh, like that... Well, what sort of questions did the Americans ask you in your schools here about Japan? Oh... <laughs> uh, that's, that's or what questions? Maybe not about Japan. Oh. What questions did they ask you? Just a uh, just common question. Uh, I was asked uh, very often, how do you like America? <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's it's sure. not easy question to answer in a few minutes, I think. And uh, I learned to answer. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> and then? And, uh, and they left me with satisfaction, really. And But I think, of course, uh, though I love America, but uh, I think... Americans are too easily satisfied with my answer. And uh, if uh, they were Japanese, they would never be satisfied with such a simple answer. <laughs> but if they were Japanese, they would never have the courage to ask foreigners what th they think about Japan. This makes a very interesting <laughs> point, isn't it? We at least have the courage to ask, and you would say that is a good point with us. Yes, I think Why do you think the point. Japanese wouldn't have the courage to ask? Because, uh, I don't know, we are too shy to ask, and also uh, we are afraid that uh, uh, they don't, to know that, that they don't know, uh, they don't like uh, Japan or, or like that. 
I... You know, there's another question that's interesting me here, too. Uh, you say that Japan has been completely changed by the American occupation. I'm wondering about Denmark and uh, Iceland. We have, we've had a lot of Americans in Iceland lately. What that's kind right. of an influence has that had, well, if any? It has had some influence, it mostly, has? mostly upon the social life of the teenagers. <laughs> uh, for instance, the music they're mostly fond of is, is rock and roll. And Elvis Presley is a big idol in Iceland. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, the, the, the American influence in Iceland is very superficial. It's, there's no great influence in Iceland from the Americans, <coughs> not at all. Well, there was a mm. film on television recently which showed the influence of America on Britain. I'm afraid I missed the film, but I'm afraid, as in England, it's, it's superficial. It hits the, 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 the clothing uh, in some respect, yes, uh, the music, the rock and roll, and of course the teddy boys. <laughs> well, it's, it's, as far as them are concerned, of course it hits them to a certain extent, as I think it does in nearly all of Europe, that when you get a new mode here in, uh, in America, well then most of the youngsters uh, want to try that too. But generally I think that there's less conformity uh, among the Danish youngsters than there is over here. Uh, especially, I say, among high school students and college students. Uh, they want to be original. They walk around with long hair, you know. <laughs> 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 That's really? right. They it's want to do that. Too. Yes, but I'm sure this, this is conformity really? in itself. No, 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 because not everybody does it. Not everybody does it. But you said uh, they, so there must be quite a group who. Oh, this well, well, they can find their own way of doing it, you know. And beard, you know, everybody can find their own, own way of doing oh, that. Yes. And, uh, for instance, rock and roll. <laughs> Well, of course, it came to Denmark, and of course, it's popular for a short time as it was everywhere. But now it's n nearly disappeared. Oh, yes, but I mean, you've got to realize this, that I, Denmark doesn't need to have conformity in the same sense as America. Oh, that's right. Countries like Australia that's and true. some of the Latin American countries need it. I mean, you have a history of, as a unified nation. You've had your moments of crisis when you've all pulled together, as my own country has. Uh, Americans have got, still got a constant influx of immigrants, and they do need to... Uh, uh, sort of press on these people to be conformists, to be Americans. Well, but that's true. That's, of course, what I do sometimes in their schools, too, always in their social status, for instance. And that's uh, along the same line. They have to teach them uh, how to work together. We don't know that problem, but, I mean, uh, sometimes I think that uh, some Americans have got the, the idea that whenever they get something here in the United States uh, of that sort of conformity, then it goes all over Europe, and it is like this in Europe, too. It isn't always true. It isn't. Of course, one thing that I don't quite understand is if rock and roll doesn't appeal to your young people as it does to ours, uh, why do they, why are they interested in it? Is this something that's an American importation that we're forcing on you? Oh, no, not really. It, it, we don't have rock and roll in the American sense exclusively. We have a sort of, uh, we, we combine rock and roll, traditional jazz, cha-cha from France, <laughs> a lot of the Latin American tempos into what we call jive, which is, I think, a European style of rock and roll. And we have our own type of music called skiffle, <laughs> which is played on the, on the banjo, which is folk music, jazz, jazzed up. Skiffle? Yes. Is that something new? Skiffle. It would sweep <laughs> America Have you heard about this over here? Tell us more. Well, you've never heard about this over no? here? No. Oh, oh, well, you have, you have two banjos, or, or two guitars, one of them which is electric, and um, you have a double bass for a lot of rhythm and drums and somebody playing on one of those corrugated washboards. You know the old washboards with washboard. washboard. corrugated metal? Yeah. You put thimbles on your fingers <laughs> and you rub them and that creates rhythm too. Where did this start? It came from England, didn't it? It came from England, yes. Yeah. Has it uh, yeah. gone to Iceland? Uh, I, no, not yet. You don't know, but how about yes, Japan? No. <laughs> Rock and roll is very popular and Elvis Presley is very popular. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I have never... Of skiffle. Uh, I want to come back to something you and Ivan just started to talk about a moment ago and left it while I was still very interested to hear what else you had to say when you were saying that the Danish students uh, wear long hair and beards and try oh, to be so original and you started to tell us yes. about the Japanese. Well, tell yes. us more. Among, especially among boys, they they broke their you know, heart, had a, it's a uniform, a, a sort of uniform, and on purpose they broke. They break. they break? Yes, they break. And I don't know why the beard, oh, it's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> oh, don't say that. <laughs> really? And Does they're it? never ironed, <laughs> you know. They're, uh, uh, black, uh, no, they're shirt. <laughs> well, this confuses me. You say Japan has changed completely, but I shouldn't have thought that the Japanese interest in exquisite beauty and perfectness would have changed to this extent. 
don't know. I really. I hope this isn't an American influence. No, it's not. It's from uh, long, long ago. Really. Well, is it just the students that do yeah, this? Yes, the students. And what do the, the parents say to that? Oh, parents don't care of boys. <laughs> you mean parents only care what girls do? Uh, yes, well, not look, there's another area that you could help us on, Yama. We've been talking for three months now about the difference between East and West. Western influence on the East and lack of Eastern influence on the West. But here you are from a completely Eastern country. And you say that there's a great deal of Western influence in Japan. Oh, yes. But it doesn't seem to have mattered. You've still got every bit of your traditions, your, your, oh, yes. your grace, your way of thinking. Don't you think Yama could help us a little on this point? Yes. Uh, I think um, in a, during the three months, um, I made my idea, uh, its oriental idea, strong. I think it's it's funny because <laughs> before I came here, uh, I I was quite a westernized girl among uh, my friends. But um, and I, I I came here before I came here. I I confess you, <laughs> I never. I agree with uh, arranged marriage. <laughs> <laughs> and I against it. But uh, after I came here, uh, I, I, I completely agree with arranged marriage. <laughs> oh. Now, this is a double, double yeah, thing. Really interesting. Uh, analyze this. this. This is extremely interesting. <laughs> analyze it. How has this happened? Now, uh, I, uh, I saw that uh, Western custom and Western culture and uh, also other things, and mm, I think uh, that is uh, very pure. And Esther said um, someday uh, that uh, when uh, they got married, and mm, that is the first man she she met. I think it's very pure. It's fine. <laughs> so when you go back to Japan, you are now for the first time going to be believing in arranged marriages. I hope. <laughs> But this, this arranged marriage is devoid of romance. It's not. Where do you have oh, your we, romance? We can, we can begin to love him. And that isn't after you've married him. That isn't romance. Yes, it's it's done, though, isn't it? I think it's fine. It's yeah. too late to start loving somebody after it's you've married not him, too isn't late. it? But, but if you find out you don't like him at all, what then? Oh, just hmm. we resign it. You resign yourself. Resign. Ah, that's it then. You think the difference lies in the difference between the Eastern temperament and the Western temperament. You would resign yourself to it, whereas a Western woman certainly wouldn't. She'd fight against it, wouldn't she? What, what, about, about, what about resignment? Don't you feel that it's a sacrifice? It's sacrifice, but uh, I think we need sacrifice. Isn't it wasting your life, though, if you're going to be sort of thwarted by unhappiness for the rest of your married life? No, I cannot... I cannot answer, but uh, I think... I don't think uh, we, you know, uh, I don't think uh, I'm sacrificing myself to a uh, home, to society. So but what about mm. the children in these marriages? If, if, the, if the mother doesn't like the father after they've got married, what about the children? Won't they be brought up in an unha unhappy atmosphere? But <laughs> it, 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 it doesn't happen so often, very often. No. Oh, may, may I ask you another question? Uh, you Easterners have said so often when we've been discussing in the forum about uh, these uh, marriages that uh, just look at the divorce rates in the Western countries. I can see the difference. Uh, well, what about in Japan? Uh, can, oh. you, can you get a divorce if you want to? Uh, the percentage of divorce is um, higher. Uh, in a, among arranged ma marriage, it's lower than uh, among love marriage. But then again, it's a difference in temperament. Uh, you would not want to change it, you would resign yourself to it, whereas a Western person wants to change it mm. and would fight against it. So there's a, a difference in temperament, not of system, so much. I'm going to have to come back then. You say American occupation has changed, changed Japan completely, that it's been very strong influence in the changed school system and upbringing of young people. But I wouldn't say it had changed Yama no. very much, would no. you? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> well, then where's the contradiction? Where, uh, there's a contradiction. Where is the change? We really want to know, where is the change in Japan? Oh. It's... What? <laughs> oh. It's, it's difficult to miss more, really. I know, but that's yeah. why it's interesting, because it's difficult. <laughs> You're the one Eastern country that has had this vast Western influence. And by watching and understanding what's going on in Japan, 
I think we can understand a lot about what but, may be going to happen in other Eastern countries. And politics, they uh, politics was changed completely. That is the most clear thing, uh, definitely changed. Why do you suppose you have such a higher percentage of people voting than we do in America? Oh, that's because I think uh, before the war, uh, we didn't have any freedom in the politics. And uh, also, women couldn't vote. And after the war, and, uh, we began to notice, uh, recognize the freedom, our freedom. And uh, we began to recognize it is our freedom. So, go oh, ahead, I, 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 I'd, ask a, I'd like to ask a question about that when you mentioned the word freedom. Because that's really another contradiction, I think, when we're speaking about these marriages. That's always the word we bring out in the West about freedom and individual freedom. And, and, and now you speak about that the Japanese want their freedom. How come? But it's... Uh, Is it another it, sort of freedom? As for me, it's really a contradiction, I think. But if you want your freedom, does that mean that you're going to move away from arranged marriages towards romantic marriages, which are surely a greater expression isn't, of freedom? Isn't it different from... You know, politics are... <laughs> you mean well, it's on the surface? This idea of freedom then just enters into politics. It doesn't go into social or economic life. Yes, but that's it, right. It, it's, <laughs> a, it's, yes, a very that's right. It's, it's a pretty superficial sort of freedom then, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> well, but you say it doesn't go into social life. I read just a day or two ago mm. that the Japanese woman who bows down on her knees and touches her head to the floor oh, when her husband comes home at night... Yes. Yeah. I it's changing, it, is it? It's not changing. Still, we, we do. We do? <laughs> yes, we do. Still. Well, uh, you've just criticized America for not paying enough interest into this great effect America has had on Japan. And then yes, you said that the freedom is superficial. They you, <laughs> you say these people go to vote more often than the Americans do mm -hmm. because they value their freedom more. Mm -hmm. And then you say that the freedom itself is more superficial than the Americans' freedom. Oh, it's... <laughs> It's really a contradiction, and uh, so because um, Japan has changed, has been changed too fast because of our oh, thing. Yes. Mm -hmm. That That's could be it. This yes. could be a reaction because, to the first. You know, yeah. Young people want to become westernized because uh, not 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 me. <laughs> 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 because uh, it's uh, it's more free. Yes. So, but uh, old people want to clean their custom. Because they cannot adjust so fast uh, to the new uh, new situation. In other words, you are more in the change than you have changed. Is that what you mean? Yeah. It's very hard to adjust themselves to new society. Would you say? Is it possible to say whether the boys your age or the girls your age are more influenced by the West? Oh, girls! I think. Now we're getting into another contradiction here. No, just uh, just the surface. I know. I I mean, uh, clothes or. Uh, well, no just, ways just ways clothes. of thinking. Not no. I don't mean ways of ways of thinking. Just clothes or. But oh, I'm sorry, Mrs. Wall. Uh, boys. Ways of thinking. Yes, it's boys. Mm -hmm. Well, I wonder how this comes out. How do you notice it? Because oh. Uh, they can, they can be more free than uh, girls, and parents, uh, for instance, parents don't take care of for boys so much, and um, also. <laughs> so You're going to make us all want to come to Japan, Yukiko. <laughs> <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> It's going to be interesting. Maybe after you've been home six months, you can tell I us answers to really this one. Japan. I'm sorry. I'm glad you got us off on this subject of social customs again, but I had really <laughs> wanted to have a final discussion on education. Maybe this is more basic education than anything we could read in the books. But uh, if I can bring you back in the last minute or two to education, Ivan, uh, what's the thing that really stands out now in your thinking as you've been going over the matter of education, and particularly at the high school level, what do you think the basic aims should be in high school education? Can you try to answer that? Well, I'm glad you brought out this word aim, because when we go around here, and we see a lot of differences in the way to do it, but 
you would always have to try to look through this and look at the end. And I think that even if the different countries have got different purposes and uh, different necessities, I think that education in any part of the world should have at least two basic aims. That it would give you the ability to choose yourself between different and divergent ideas. And then on the other hand, it should give you this responsibility, this freedom of choice requires. Because you have to remember that another man's right of choice has to be, res has to be respected too. In other words, you have to really find out about what really makes another people tick. What makes you tick in Japan? <laughs> <laughs> you see, uh, what, what you have chosen and what you believe and why you did that, it's hard for us to find out about. And you'll have to come away from misunderstanding and prejudice. Because I think that a lot of world problems are caused by that instead of by real differences. And these differences and, and these um, misunderstandings and prejudices breed supranationalism. It teaches students that their nation is the only nation or their religion is the only religion. And what I think is even the most dangerous thing is that when that it teaches them that their policy and system of government is the only one that's right. You're hitting on the basic problem then of whether you should teach He's chauvinism no. or patriotism. Well, let me put it in this way. We've got to sum up. I'm sorry, you Ivan. You should teach patriotism without chauvinism. Without chauvinism. <laughs> and I'm sure each one of you would know how to do that. It's a hard thing to tell anybody else to do. Perhaps one could put it another way and say that the revolution that's taken place in countries' relations with each other since the war hasn't been matched by a corresponding revolution in how we teach young people about other countries. Would you say that's true? Yes. Well, you've helped us all very much. We're very grateful to you, to the schools that trained you, to the ministers of education that sent you here, to the airlines that brought you, to the American schools who have fed and clothed you and given you this double challenge, which gave you an opportunity to learn and an obligation